Welcome to Story Hour with Miss Barbara. This fifth story uh, about our farm in Indiana I'll call The Birds and the Bees. But it's not about babies. Uh, maybe I should call it the, the Birds and the Bugs because I have never lived any place as, I, as I've experienced in Indiana that had so many bugs. I mean, just walking from the barn or from the house to the barn, you had to walk through um, a curtain of bugs. Your body would part these, this wall of bugs. And they were flying and bombarding you from all directions, zillions of kinds. But there were two good things about that. One was the lightning bugs. I have never seen anywhere else the beautiful display of lightning bugs on a summer night. Just looking out over the field of fireflies was, was like seeing a million stars come dancing down to earth. So that was one good thing about so many bugs. Being a, a, Indiana was such a haven for insects. And um, the other thing was the birds. Of course, they had lots of food to eat. So there were lots of birds. And Indiana is where I um, first came up with the idea that that bird song is kind of like uh, words. I mean, now I've heard of things like the horned owl saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? But um, in those days, I really hadn't realized that, but I think I did subconsciously because when I heard certain birds for the first time, I knew immediately from their song what kind of bird they were. For example, one night I was in the house and it was just late spring, it was just getting to be dusk, and I heard this. Outside, and I knew that was a whippoorwill. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill, just from his song. And to me, that is a sound of dusk. A sound for the bright, sunshiny afternoon, it goes like this. And first time I heard that, I knew that was a Bob White. And so I found this, um, this book that has 250 recorded bird songs from North America. And so here's the one for the Bob White. And see if you think that sounds like the Bob White. So you see the Bob White is kind of like a quail. And we had those. And then here's the whippoorwill. You hear it? Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. And this time I noticed in the recording the crickets. So it's definitely uh, an evening song. The other, um, well, so that those are the two benefits of all those bugs. Now you would consider your house to be a safe haven from the bugs, right? Well, not always. There were two kinds of bugs, I mean, that are famous for coming inside, ants and cockroaches. So I got so familiar with wiping the counter with thousands of ants, just wiping them off with my washcloth, 
that I got familiar with that sickly sweet smell that the ants give off when they're dying. Well, I found out that is their call to other ants to come. So I stopped that practice. I had to learn how to keep the ants away in other ways. So I learned how to put the honey jar on a little lid with water and keep the water filled um, and just different things like that. So Indiana is where I first uh, began my journey with uh, dealing with ants in a humane way. And it isn't just uh, feel good type of stuff. It's to me, it's what really works. The other way doesn't work. Um, so for example, when I lived in China, there were little tiny ants that started coming uh, out from the rug along the couch where my students would sit. I suppose we had dropped things that we ate and bite their legs and I couldn't have that. So I looked up what to do and I put cinnamon under that carpet all under there and the problem stopped. And uh, it helped that I read a story once about a man who um, wanted to communicate with animals and, and treat them in a more humane way. And he started with communicating with a German shepherd. And once he got this, this Bible verse came to his head. So he looked it up and it said, it was from Job, and it said, Go to the ants, ye sluggard, and learn from them. So he kind of took that as a message that he should learn from the animals. And so his whole book was about all the things that he learned. And, and there was really some neat stories. One of them was a story about how he had a refrigerator full of food, a little one, out in his on his deck. And the ants were just carting off all the food. So he decided to try this technique that he was learning about. So he opened the refrigerator door. He spoke to the ants and said, Dear ants, I, I don't want to be mean to you. I know you have your livelihood too, but this is my food that I need. And I really wish you would go find some other food for yourself. And then he left the door open and he walked away and left it. And the next day he came back and the ants were gone. So I thought, okay, this is when I'm here in Ukiah. I thought I would kind of try that. I was kind of getting fed up. I mean, I never smashed the ants anymore. I didn't want any more of that horrible smell calling the ants. So I would sweep them in with a, into a little dustpan with my broom and take them outside and dump them out there. But sometimes I'd be making a lot of trips outside. So one year I decided to try that technique and I prayed or communicated or whatever I think I could do to the ants. And the next day I was coming into the door doorway and I noticed this whole horde of ants coming over the, the step of the door, the doorstep and going out. It was like a mass exodus from my house. And I went inside and there was not an ant to be seen. And there was no ant to be seen for the rest of that season. Now, I'm not saying that no ants ever came back. I don't have any right now, thank goodness, but it is winter. Um, but um, I, it just showed me that there are other ways of dealing with pests. <laughs> and uh, it might sound counterintuitive, but I think certain animals breed more the more you kill them. They, they just populate more. And two of those that come to my mind are coyotes and cockroaches. And speaking of cockroaches, um, I have a story of where my husband and I were meditating one night in the, uh, in the bedroom. 
we had our chairs up against the wall and a little table in between us with a candle lit on it. And we were sitting there trying to meditate. And everything was really quiet and just the sputtering of the candle. And then suddenly there was this loud sputtering and we looked and a cockroach had flown into the candle light and immolated itself on the candle flame. And I became fascinated with that image of the cockroach coated in wax, forever frozen. Well, I don't think we, I think maybe that was our first and last time trying to meditate. But anyway, we also had a lot of bees on our farm. And since I walked around barefoot everywhere, even out on the pasture, out to the barn, I got a lot of bee stings because there was a lot of clover. And so I'd be stepping on clover blossoms that bees were trying to get nectar from. And I'd get stung on my foot. But it didn't bother me because I had the antidote. And it grew right next to the clover. It was broadleaf plantain leaves. You just pick one of those, chew it, put it on the bee sting, and in 10 seconds, the pain is gone. There's never any swelling. And when you have that around, you don't even worry about bee stings anymore. At least I didn't. Um, and I found that um narrow leaf plantain which is the only kind that grows here in ukiah also works because i had a little five-year-old boy for lunch once sitting on the deck and we were eating and a, a yellow jacket came along and was crawling on his lip and he tried brushing it off but it stung him so he wasn't too happy about that and um so i ran and got a plantain leaf showed him how to chew it up and put it on there. And he was just amazed at how quickly the pain went away. Well, Tom, turns out, was also amazed by the power of this plant. One day, I was in the house and he was outside mowing the lawn with this big power mower, that riding mower that he had borrowed. And all of a sudden, the sound of the, the loud motor sound stopped. And then a second later, the front door opened and slammed shut. And I looked, and there was Tom inside the door, brushing off something from his neck and his face. So apparently, the bees got angry with that sound of that mower. And they went after him. The, we had a beehive out there in front in the front yard. And uh, so he got had four stings on his neck and face. So I ran out the back door and got some plantain leaves and showed him how to chew it up and put it on his bites. And he became a believer in the power of herbs. Uh, up until that point, he didn't think that they worked. But um, he had no pain and no swelling. So that was kind of neat to share that, my faith in herbs with him. So our bees normally were not something that we feared. We, we were very comfortable around the bees. I mean, we loved our bees. They were... In a couple years, they were going to give us some nice golden sweet honey. But um, so Tom, in the meantime, he took to watching those bees. He got fascinated by um, bee life. I mean, we had a, it was just one stack of trays, all painted white on the edge. So this was like a white beehive, and it was on this platform that made kind of a, a landing zone for the bees. 
and Tom used to watch them by the hour. He would, I think he even took a chair out there and would just sit and watch. And then he would come in at dinner time and tell me what he learned, what his observations were. Well, one thing he noticed was that the bees were divided into different job squads. And one squad had the job of keeping the landing platform clean. They would take their little front legs and just be sweeping constantly on the front of that platform. And that was where the worker bees would land. They'd come in from, from uh, harvesting nectar from the flowers, and then they would go into the little hole at the bottom, this little wide hole at the bottom, into the hive to deposit their nectar. There was a, a group of bees who had the job to guard the hive so that no foreign bees from any other hive could get in. They were kind of what you might call the uh, border patrol. And, but their border patrol, the bee border patrol, was a lot worse than ours. I mean, if they saw a bee that didn't belong there, and I don't know how they knew which one did and which one didn't, but they did. And they would, two of them would work together. They'd grab that bee, cut off his wings, and throw him on the ground outside the landing pad. So I'd say that those bees were history. So um, these are some of the things we learned about the bees. And unfortunately, the stories about the bees are all we really got out of that hive. But why, I'll tell you another time. But I'm thinking now that the stories were the best thing that we could have gotten from them. What do you think? Thanks for listening. Bye for now.